Hi everyone, this is Chicho, and welcome to another comic book haul video, okay? And this video is sort of a follow-up to the previous comic book haul video we did, where I mentioned that I'm sort of on a comic book budget right now, so we did a little mini comic book haul in the last comic book haul video, where we ended up grabbing 10 comic books for like 14.50 Canadian, which was like $11 US or something, right? And we ended up getting some amazing comic books there. Uh, one or two key issues, I guess, and the rest were just fantastic comic books. I was very happy to have in my collection, right? And uh, I was sort of tracking some of the other comic books that this seller had on eBay. And he's a local seller, so I don't have to pay any shipping for when I buy these comic books, so I go to the store and pick up the comic books, right? And uh, I was tracking some of these books, and basically what happened was um, after loading on the previous comic book haul video, I meant, you know, I mentioned that I'm on a comic book budget, right? And someone that uh, has been following my work, uh, they sent me a message saying they love my comic book haul videos and they send a little bit of funds my way to increase my comic book buy, to increase the comic book hauls that we have, right? So a huge thank you to Brian for sending those funds, supporting this work for us to be able to get a bigger comic book haul, okay? Because this sort of went beyond my budget. So a huge chunk of this comic book haul that we're gonna look at is thanks to Brian for sending those funds in this direction. And we ended up getting some amazing comic books, some fantastic books. Uh, couple of key issues, couple of issues that I've really wanted to have in my collection actually more than a couple of <laughs> a couple of issues that i really wanted to have in my collection and the rest of these books were are uh, fantastic books very happy to have them and um, i'll just put this out there um, since it's been coming up before we look at the comic book haul right i know that there is uh, getting into comic book collecting can be expensive right it can be expensive but you can definitely do it on a budget okay and a lot of people uh, i found that they chase a lot of hot books and if you're chasing hot books you're going to be paying a very premium price for those hot books right now that's sort of the name of the game that's sort of what happens in the comic book industry but please keep this in mind if you're thinking about getting the comic book collecting or whatnot if you stop chasing hot books what you'll find out is you can get your hands on some amazing comic books for an amazing price because what you find out is some of those hot books sell for ridiculous amounts of money and then the next issue in the series you can buy for a dollar or very cheap relative to that hot book right and the next issue in the series would have the same writers the same artists featuring the same characters continuing from a story that would have started from the previous issue, right? So you're getting an amazing comic book, right? That is in the series telling a grand story, sometimes epic stories that continue on for dozens of issues, right? And you're getting it for a song and a dance. Sometimes you can get it in a dollar bin. Sometimes you can get it for less than a dollar. Sometimes you're gonna get a whole bunch of them for like two or three dollars, right? So if you're thinking about getting into comic books, it can be an expensive hobby, okay? But it doesn't have to be. And for me, what I end up doing is, when I start collecting comic books, I look for amazing deals. I don't necessarily chase hot books. It's very, very rare that I chase hot books. I buy comic books for the love of comic books. And I don't necessarily read right away everything that I'm dying, not uh, that I'm buying, not even close, right? You know, in the past, I've mentioned this. When we started this comic book series of videos that we've been producing, which was, I guess, like five or six years ago, I believe in even in the first comic book video that I put out, I mentioned that I would have, at that time, I would have probably read maybe anywhere between 30, 35% of my collection, right? Right now, it's probably down to, because we've been in a lot of comic book calls, right now, it's probably down to like, 20 25 percent of the comic books i've read in my collection right that means if i go on a major budget or no budget where i don't have the funds to buy comic books 
what I can do is go to my comic book collection and just pick up comic comic books that I haven't read and read those or reread the comic books that I have in my collection right like if I stop buying comic books right now and if I kept on reading comic books every day I probably have enough comic books to read for a decade 10 years right so you're buying comic books not just because they're hot if you're really into comic book collecting you're buying comic books because they either have an amazing story to tell you like the artist you like the writers you like the character they happen to be uh, from a genre from a period that you find interesting may it be the golden age of comics silver bronze modern age whatever period it might be okay i just wanted to mention that because uh, this topic has been has come up a fair bit where comic book collecting happens to be very expensive but just like anything else whatever you do it really depends on you what you want to make of it okay that's my intro to this as far as this comic book haul and again thank you Brian for the support for sending the extra funds so we could grab these books okay because this comic book haul would not be as big as it is it's only 18 bucks right but it wouldn't be as big as it is if it wasn't for Brian for that help for that support okay now this comic book seller is a local seller right so there's no shipping costs involved fantastic we're saving money now I go to his store and I pick up the books right and he had these comic books in this bag and you can tell you know initially it was going to be this much and then it ended up being this much and it ended up being this much right and then plus little tax involved because it is local so it ended up costing about a hundred dollars Canadian right ninety four dollars plus some taxes so hundred dollars Canadian which comes out to around seventy five dollars US okay now we ended up getting 18 books for that right okay so hundred dollars Canadian 20 bucks it ended up costing around five dollars per book and this comic book haul is contains golden age silver age bronze age modern age comics okay and copper age comics okay and what we're gonna do is go through the books as I sort of I took some notes I took I dug down into this right because there were some books that I really wanted to grab because of their historical significance for me because I love the writers I love the characters or because there's some books here that I love the covers uh, there's two of them that I really like the covers I've been trying to get my hands on right actually there's about five books here that I've been trying to get my hands on that we're able to get a fantastic price so we got them in our collection right as far as the first book goes and what I'm gonna do is I'm not gonna I'm just gonna go through and do the books in this order that I've taken notes from okay now the first book is the invisibles by Grant Morrison okay and this is done uh, written by Grant Morrison and the artwork is by Steve Yowell okay and the cover was done by Ryan Hughes and this is considered to be the first major uh, continuing series comic book series that Grant Morrison has done uh, and it's basically for vertigo comics okay it came out in 1994 okay the vertigo imprint is uh, dc comics and this sort of came about from the british invasion of com uh, comic book artists writers or creators basically that came uh, to the united states from the uk and a lot of them were producing a lot of work for uh, a comic book magazine in the UK called 2000 AD right and Grant Morrison is one of them Alan Moore is another one Neil Gaiman is another one there's a whole bunch of them that came out from the UK and they started producing works for DC comics in the 1980s and those books started becoming extremely popular so DC comics what they ended up doing was putting out an imprint sort of an umbrella where a lot of those 
writers and creators started creating their own mini series or continuing series under that imprint right and the invisibles is one of those series and this is considered to be the first sort of official full-blown series that grant morrison controlled right now i've never read the series okay looking forward to it this has been optioned to become a tv series okay i don't know how far down the road it is or if it's ever gonna you know become a tv series but it's been optioned and i'm glad i got my hands on this before the prices kicked up if it hits the uh if it comes out okay we ended up grabbing this thing for 550 canadian 420 us okay this is special as well the reason being is i brought this close you might have noticed it's signed by grant morrison and he's got a little anarchy symbol drawn on there as well and the notes that the person had written uh, the seller had written he said uh, signed on the cover by grant morrison at san diego comic-con in 1994 and he mentions that he even drew a little anarchy symbol on there okay and uh, if you know if you've followed some of the other comic book videos i put out I had a little small comic book publishing company in the early 1980s, mid-1990s. And I was at the San Diego Comic-Con, either 1994 or 1995, okay? And if I was there in 1994, this was signed and came out the time I was there. I might have been there in 1995. I'm not 100% sure might have been 1993 as well I can't remember so 1994 plus or minus a year so I'm happy to have this in my collection and at some point I'm going to try to get my hands on this whole series sometime in the future where I can afford it right or pick up the collected works and read the collected works okay the next book that we got is let me find it here is this guy or this lady okay this is Shanna the she-devil number one and this came out in 1973 okay and it's the first appearance oh sorry 1972 and it's the first appearance of Shanna the she-devil okay and it's graded at a uh, very good plus oh yeah by the way the invisibles is graded at he graded at near mint minus and the seller grades them fair okay he doesn't lowball them he doesn't highball them it's basically the grade that he gives them right so the invisibles was near mint minus this is graded at very good plus okay and it's the first appearance of shana the she devil now this cover beautiful cover okay is done by jim Stranko. okay and in the previous comic book haul we grabbed uh, two nick fury agent of shield the cover is done by uh, jim Stranko as well right and he did the covers for issue number one and issue number two of the series okay uh, the writing for this was done by carl so uh, Car carol sulig okay and there was some additional text added by uh steve gerber Ger gerber okay and the pencils were done by george tasca okay i'm reading my notes because i want to pronounce these names correctly okay and i found i did a little digging and i found a little um right up here i'd like to read for you okay now some of these writer the the writer for this carol Su, uh, sulig s-e-u-l-i-n-g she didn't do too many comic book writings but the artist for this george tasca he did some golden age books he did crime does not pay captain marvel iron man and the inks for this were done by vince coletta okay and He's done a fair bit of work, Vince Coletta, I believe anyway. And the letters were done by John Cos, uh, Costanza. And he's, John Costanza did a tremendous amount of work for uh, 
Marvel Comics and DC Comics. He's, he's been around for a long time, right? He worked uh, with uh, Jack Kirby a lot. He did uh, the letters for New Gods, Mr. Miracle, Forever People, Conan the Barbarian, as well as doing the lettering for Alan Moore's Swamp Thing. And if you've ever read Alan Moore's Swamp Thing, uh, I have it here. Here's one of them. Here's two of the sort of a collections, the first uh, beginnings of it. The lettering for it is absolutely, everything about it is absolutely brilliant. Okay. But, like, really, there's some pages here which are beautiful. Just beautiful. Here, let me show you. Right? Like, this is what we're talking about. So if you've never read Alan Moore's Swamp Thing, highly recommend it, read it. Okay, like, I know this doesn't include the cover, the, look at the splash page, right? So he did the lettering for this, uh, for much of, I'm flipping, trying to find some trippy lettering that he had on here, but I can't find any right now. Uh, but it is beautiful, okay, it is beautiful. So there's some major, put this back so there's a major people that worked on this right here's the cover again let me show it to you now keep this in mind okay this cover let me read you something that I came across when I was uh, digging this up okay now let's go to you uh, uh, Vince, uh, I got some stuff for Vince Coletti, and Vince Coletti did a lot of the inks for Jack Kirby as well. Okay, but uh, we'll skip that part. Da, 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 da. Shana the she Let me read you this part. Shana the She Devil was introduced in one of a trio of Marvel comics aimed at a female audience, alongside Night Nurse and Claws of the Cat. Now, Night Nurse, uh, I have one issue of night nurse they go for a premium price people are chasing night nurse big time right uh, and the seller had night nurse on on his auction and i couldn't get my hands on them they were they were going they're above my budget right so night nurse and claws of the cat marvel marvel writer editor roy thomas and roy thomas is huge recalled in 2007 that editor-in-chief, editor now we're going into quotes of what Roy Thomas wrote, editor-in-chief Stan Lee had the idea, quote, had the idea, and I think the names for all three. He wanted to do some books that would have special appeal to girls. We were always looking for ways to expand our franchise. My idea, dot, 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 was to try to get get women to write them dot 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 i thought of my friend carol suling who had done a bit of writing for her ex-husband phil in conjunction with his con comic cons i approached her to do the shana book because i knew she liked jungle comics and adventure comics i put ross ross and duro on as the shana artist beginning with issue number two so the issue number one was the artist was da, 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 George Tusca. Okay, so he did a lot of work uh, for Golden Age books, Crime Does Not Pay Marvel, Captain Marvel, Iron Man, and stuff like this. But he only he only did the pencils for the first issue. The second issue is uh, da, 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 uh, Russ Andura on Shana, uh, Shana artist, beginning with issue number two, with Vinny. Coletta inking to make Russ's Shanna look attractive. So the idea was to make the female stars attractive, okay? Soothing in 2010, and then and, and quoting Roy Thomas, and we're going to the article, I believe I grabbed this off wiki. Soothing in 2010 recalled, my instructions were to make Shanna someone who would fit in with the times and also was prone to a little more violence than Sheena on the other jungle queen on the other jungle queens of the past okay so that part I found interesting uh, 
I didn't know that when I bought the book. I bought the book specifically for the cover. And because it's the first appearance of Shanna the She-Devil, and we ended up grabbing this at a fantastic price of, of, of $4.03 Canadian, $3.08 US, and beautiful, beautiful, right? Absolutely beautiful. Okay. The next haul, okay. Now this one is from the golden age of comics. And I have some of these books, not, th not this series, but some of the same themes of these books in my collection and they're sports comics. I don't collect too many sports comics, but if I see things that are interesting, I try to get my hands on them. And this was interesting. This is Mel Allen sports comics from 1950 it's issue number six but it's issue number two in the series there was only two issues of this book of this series put out okay there's issue number five and issue number six which is issue number one and issue number two okay and this is graded at good so it's graded 2.0 out of 10. okay and uh, i didn't know this i i looked it up when i was bidding on it that's one of the reasons I sort of bid on this. And we ended up getting this thing for $5.11 Canadian, $3.90 US, okay? And Mel Allen, this guy here, okay? I didn't know this because I don't know my baseball history, but he was considered to be the voice of the Yankees, okay? Um, I'll read you a little bit here. Uh, in 19, I'll read you a couple of paragraphs here. In 1952, Allen was one of the first three celebrities spoofed in the just created mad satirical comic book. Okay. In the second issue, Allen, giant manager Leo Droscher, and Hall of Fame Yankee catcher Yogi Berra were all uh, character, caricatured in baseball in a baseball story, right? So Mal, Mad Magazine, EC Comics, did a little story with Mal in their book, sort of a spoof, okay? That, that, that baseball story was called Hex, illustrated by Jack Davis. His likeliness was also licensed in, by Standard Comics for a two-issue Mel's Sports Comics, right? series between 1949 and 1950 so this came out in 1950 and i believe the first issue for the series came out in 1949 okay and a little right up here uh, mal allen was an american sportscaster best known for his long tenure as the primary play by play announcer for the new york y yankees during the peak period from 1940 1950s and 1960s right so he was very well known Glad to have this in my collection. I'll, uh, one day when I sort my comic books, it'll go into the sports comic books um, area, right? So I'm assuming, so check this out. Lou Gilleg, I don't even know how you were pronounce this. G Gilleg, Gilleg's Farewell to Baseball by Mel Allen, right? You got Danny Glover in Fistic Fear for All, a boxing story. You got Pop Meeker tells the story of Glenn Cunningham. And I don't know Glenn Cunningham. I don't know if he's a sprint runner or a marathon runner. And you got Dick Hardy in the mystery picture. Okay. And you got Mel Allen here. How about that? I guess that's one of the sayings he used to say, right? That's cool. A little bit of comic book history or basically pop culture history, right? Sports history right here. Fantastic. For a song and a dance of $3.90 US. <laughs> fantastic, fantastic. Here's uh, another comic book we got because we got it a great deal. I picked it up. 
I have this comic book in my collection. The first comic book haul we did, okay, way, way back a few years ago, was a comic book haul where we grabbed a whole bunch of dare, Daredevil books, like a hundred plus Daredevil books. And one of them was this one, I believe. Daredevil number 13. Look at this. Look at this. And this guy is came out in 1966. Uh, Jack Kirby and John Romita. Okay. And we got this for $6.89 Canadian, $5.26 US. And it's graded at very good. And that is a very good price for Daredevil number 13 at very good. Okay. The covers ja uh, Jack Kirby. The script is Stan Lee. The pencils layouts is Jack Kirby. Okay. And John Romita did the finishes for this, I believe. And he did the inks for this as well. And the lettering is Sam Rosen. Nice. Okay. And it's got the Kazar appearance as well. Okay. And Kazar connects up with uh, Shanna as well, the She Devil. Okay. Because uh, she appeared in uh, the Kazar comic books as well. I believe Kazar might have appeared in the second series of Shanna as well. And there's Kazar right there down there. See him? Okay. I believe it's part two of them. Cool. Glad to have this. And a very good is. It's a great price for this, okay? Fantastic price for this. And if you haven't watched the Netflix Daredevil series, watch it. It's very good. Very, very good. Okay. Everybody was very happy for that. As was I. As was I. I grabbed those comic book, uh, the those books before the Netflix Daredevil series came on because in I was sort of getting them in anticipation of the Daredevil series right here's a couple more books okay Jack Kirby Jack Kirby check this out check this out now this one I paid these two books I sort of paid fair value for I do have number one okay this is the demon number two okay and it came out in 1972 and this is graded very fine and that's a good grade it's a high grade for this okay and it's written uh the cover is by jack kirby let me do a little move over here so i can read what i've written down okay the cover is by jack kirby and mike rover the script is by Jack Kirby. The pencils is by Jack Kirby. And the inks and letters are by Mike Royer. Royer, sorry, not Rover. Royer, okay. And Demon is an interesting character. The first appearance was in Demon number one that I do have in my collection. And I have some of the Demon books in my collection. But I don't, I don't think I have Demon number two. And I didn't, don't have Demon number two. I'm pretty sure about that. And... We paid fair value for this. Some people will say we pay, paid a pretty good price for this. We, this thing cost $12.71 Canadian, which was $9.70 US, okay? And I always, when I bid on eBay, I, I don't go $9, I go, I go wacko numbers. I like randomness in it, right? So $12.71, 71 cents Canadian, <laughs> right? Okay, fantastic. Happy to have this in my collection. And we also grabbed Demon number 14, okay? And again, um, Jack Kirby and Mike Royer. And this is graded at fine. It came out in 1973, okay? And it cost us $2.89 Canadian which is $2.21 US. Fair value, fair value. Drop it rhymes, the demon is. He, when he speaks, he, he speaks in rhymes. And there's a new a sort of rebirth of demon that I've seen come up. I don't know if it's a, a one shot or if it's, uh, 
going to be a continuing series or some mini series or if it was a spoof or whatnot but they drew the demon as a rapper which really fits in to what the demon would be right dropping rhymes right lyricist this book i've been tracking okay i've been trying to get my hands on this book okay and i have a little thing i want to read for you for this okay this is judo ju number one and there was only three issue series that this get this came out okay judo ju judo joe number one came out in august 1953 golden age of comics okay and it's graded at good very good okay so it's a lower grade lower mid grade okay people will say lower grade so it's graded at I believe 3.0 good very good is 3.0 out of 10 right and as far as i know this is the first comic book series to feature martial arts judo specifically right so as far as i know i went out went on to a couple of forums asking the question and i believe i read somewhere as well that this was the first martial arts comic book series so it's a pretty key issue for me anyway as a collector uh the first issue of a martial arts comic series okay pretty cool interesting okay and i read up a little history on this so let me read you that history part i stumble on this thing which was which was cool okay uh, the cover for this the cover and art let me tell you why i see this the cover and art are done by paul w stat stoddard okay and the story is by barney kosnek and what i'm about to read for you is regarding barney kosnek the person that wrote this and i grabbed this uh, this write-up from a uh, site called Worski's I'll provide the link in the description of this video I can't pronounce that Worskyle block spot it's on a block spot and it's uh, the page is called uh, a page for Christian martial artists okay the Christian martial artist is primarily a defender of the faithful one who is uh, who in time of crisis puts himself between God's flock and danger and uh, this blog is dedicated to those who voluntarily shoulder this burden okay that's the that's where I'm getting this writing from right I want to give credit where credit is due because I found this very interesting I didn't know this when this was on my radar right and that's the one of the beautiful things about uh, comic books and sort of being cultural artifacts of human history right there's a lot of history behind these comic books behind the writers behind the artists the politics the economics of it just everything about it right human history and it's very cool digging down and finding some of that information right so I'm gonna read a little bit here okay so quote I have written about Bernard J. Kosnick's book, American Combat Judo, which came out in 1994. American Combat Judo, here, here, and here. So he's got links going to what he's written, right? So this guy, the writer, I'm going to interrupt my quotes a little bit, right? Bernard J. Kosnick, he put out a book called American Combat Judo in 1944. Okay. Today, I'd like to give you a peek at some of the fascinating facts I've dif discovered about the author thank you very much for this right Kosnick came from Russian immigrants immigrant stock and gained prominence as a two-time Big Ten champion integrate uh, inter collegiate wrestler collegiate wrestler for University of Illinois 1932 to 1934 right so he was champion wrestling champion 1932 1934 he later performed in professional wrestling exhibitions as Barney Kosnick right he was a professional wrestler 
cool. Right? Somewhere around, along the line, in addition to wrestling, he picked up some interesting in, in instruction in jujitsu and savat, 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 French foot fighting. His boxing experience experience may has may have come from his associating with association with heavyweight boxer Jack Dempsey. What? Right? During World War II, he served along Dempsey as an instructor instructor in hand-to-hand -hand combat for US Coast Guard. Together they produced a manual of close quarters fighting for US CG entitled How to Fight Tough. Right. And he has another book called How to Fight Tough. So so far he's put two books out on fighting. One of them was American Combat Judo 1944. And the other one is How to Fight Tough. And I don't know what the date for this is. How to Fight Tough. Do I have the page up here? Um, I don't have the date for this one, right? Oh, published in 1942. Okay. Published in 1942. So this is predating the comic book, right? The comic book which came out in 1953. Quote again. Published in 1942, the manual bears Dempsey's name as the as the author, along with spots written, right, sports writer Frank G. Mink. This makes sense because everyone knew his name as a heavyweight champ, even though the book contained no real boxing moves. The photos show Dempsey performing various grappling techniques on Kosnick, right? Cool. There's lots of pics. I looked this up and there's like 200 pics in one of these things, right? I surmise that Kosnick did most of the actual coaching for the volume while Dempsey supplied the name recognition. And Jack Dempsey was a heavyweight world champion boxer during the golden age of comic books, 1930s, 1940s, right? 1940s, 1950s, I believe 1930s, 1940s for like over a decade, right? In 1944, Kosnick saw his own American combat judo published it represented a lot of martial arts on found in how to fight tough plus plus much more right so there's another book 1944 after the war here's a here's here's a judo judo joe coming into play right so quote again after the war he collaborated with paul w uh, sto 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 dard which is the artist for this to produce a comic book with the title judo Jew judo Joe it lasted only three issues and each issue contained instructions in self-defense interestingly the moves taught seem to have some direct come directly from American combat judo from 1944 right super cool he's got a little bit more info here but that's the part where judo joe comes into play right and that's this book here very cool and if you want to have a read through this book right because this is part of the public domain there was another series that was put out for this in 1987 different artists and writers i believe got together and because this was part of the public domain they put out a you know i think one issue on judo joe judo joe right a comic book black and black and white comic book series okay and that came out in 1987 and this thing if you want to have a read through this because this is part of the public domain there's a website where you can read thousands i believe thousands of public domain comic books which is called comicbookplus.com and plus is p-l-u-s so it's all spelled spelled out one word and you can have a read through this book it's you know the artwork is rough i don't know if rough is the right word but it's it's very simple it's not like uh, some of the other artwork we've taken a look at right but it holds a great historical significance okay and we got this guy did i tell you how much we got this guy for we got this guy for $16.50 Canadian 
which is $12.60 US, graded at good, very good. Okay, that's a great deal as far as I, I've been able to track down. Okay, very good deal. Very happy to have this. I'll try to track down uh, the next two issues in it too and complete the, complete the series, right? Let me show you these books. Uh, there's two, three of them. Where's the other ones? There they are. Here's the other guys. Let me put these in order for you. Okay. These ones are related to the Invisibles. Okay. Not because they follow the same story, but because they have the same writer. If you know Grant Morrison's work, some people would consider this series to be the one that put him on the map. And for me, it is. This is when I came across Grant Morrison, I went, wow, wow, wow. This is Doom Patrol number 20 to number 25. Okay, <laughs> awesome. And Grant Morrison, started on doom patrol with doom patrol number 19 and i have doom patrol number 19 and a few of the grant morrison doom patrols but these ones we picked up because we got them at a great price through great comic books and doom patrol has already made their first appearance in uh, the t uh, the uh as a tv series in um uh, titans right teen titans and supposedly they're coming out with their own series. So there's going to be a Doom Patrol series out there, which I'm very curious to find out if it's going to happen or if it's for real or how it's going to be portrayed. Okay. This is a trippy series, really. If you like sort of a the brain twister, read this series. If you like characters which are just twisted, like weird, like Crazy Jane, amazing. This series has one of the it has one of the greatest villains of all time with Mr. Nobody that appeared in Doom Patrol number 26. And I tried to get my hands on that, but some guy came along and kicked it up beyond my budget. I have that issue, so I wasn't willing to pay too high of price for it because people are chasing some of these books, but they're only chasing the they're only chasing the key issues. They're not chasing the I guess non-key issues, but to me they're the key issues. This is the story, right? That's my little little rant about Doom Patrol and people collecting, just chasing key issues, right? This is Doom Patrol number 20, written by Grant Morrison. And uh, the pencils on the cover is done by Richard Case. And the inks are done by uh, Carlos uh, Garzon, okay? And Carlos Garzon only did the inks for issue number 20. And the rest of these books, the artwork is done by, the pencils is done by Richard Case, and the inks are done by Scott Hanna. Uh, colors by Michael Wolfman, and the letters by John Workman. Okay. Oh, wow. Wolfman, Workman. Cool. Here's issue number 20. We grabbed this guy for $2.25 Canadian dollar. 72 us and it's graded near mint minus good price good price the rest of these we picked up for a dollar canadian which is 75 76 cents us <laughs> right and it has robot man crazy jane okay some of the other characters appearing in here who are they negative man elastic woman uh, and Dr. Niles, okay, which is the guy in, well, I don't know if he's in the wheelchair at the time or not. I read this a long time ago. This is issue number 21, okay, graded at near mint minus dollar Canadian. Awesome. Fantastic. Yeah, I guess he is in a wheelchair because that's there he that's is. Yes. Okay. Issue number 22, okay. Graded at very fine dollar Canadian. Really, it's got 
this is some, this has got some crazy stuff. And if you want to know how wacko, how amazing this series is, I did a blog post before I even did comic book videos. Okay, back in 2010, 2011, 12, I don't know when it was. I did a blog post which I titled, let me bring out the title. This is issue number 23, okay? And it's graded at near mint. Again, a dollar Canadian. Issue number 24, fantastic. This great stories, great stories. Graded at near mint. A dollar Canadian, 75 cents US. Oh yeah, back then, board it. <laughs> right. And issue number 25. Okay. Graded at near mint. Fantastic. Look at that cover. Now, after issue number 25, for a few issues, uh, the covers were being done by Simon Bisley. And as you know, I love Simon Bisley. Simon Bisley is phenomenal, right? Let me find the article that I wrote. <laughs> and I'll read you the title for this. And I take sort of images from Grant Morrison's Doom Control number 26 because that issue number 26 is the first appearance of, of mr nobody it's like a villain uh, right or he's not a hero i don't know to me he's anti-hero right but people would consider him to be a villain and i took some pages of that just the first appearance of mr nobody just to show you how brilliant an introduction or an origin story for a character can be and i'll provide the link in the description of this video and I titled that blog post and I put that on 2013. So that's before we started doing comic book videos, right? And I have a handful of comic book articles that I wrote, right? There's Conan the Barbarian article and Barry Wynn article, and one of the, the couple of other articles, and one of them is this one. And I titled it The Beauty and Brilliant of Grant Morrison's Doom Patrol, Doom Patrol Introducing Mr. Nobody, a savior, a monster an act of <laughs> an act of sacrilege dada because he puts a super villain team together called uh, brother brother of dada i forget what it is uh, da -da -da, mr no doom patrol i read this over. yeah brotherhood of dada right and i have a little write-up and some quotes and stuff like this and you can uh and i sort of link it up to politics because i was doing a lot of political posts a lot of political articles economic articles like conan the article I have on conan links up with politics and economics and this one links up with um, politics of what was what's been going on for the last couple of decades and stuff like this but if you're not interested in that you can just flip through that and at the bottom you see the pages where mr nobody is being introduced and as far as i'm concerned it's one of the greatest introductions of any supervillain in comic book history. Absolutely brilliant, really. I'm sort of pumping up Grant Morrison's Doom Patrol a lot because it deserves it. Like, I can't even underplay it. And I still haven't read the whole, whole his whole run on Doom Patrol yet. I've read about half of it, right? One day I'm gonna sit down and read the whole thing. Uh, that is on my, what's it called, bucket list or something, okay? read grant morrison's doom patrol and you can get the issues in near mint condition for one dollar go into the dollar bin stores in your comic books look on ebay you might be able to buy sets for like five dollars right for now for now you can tell i really like that series eh? the next comic book this one i've been chasing okay i've been trying to keep tracks on this trying to get my hands on this conan the barbarian right as you know we got conan the barbarian number one and we're going to do a reading of conan the barbarian and we already have at least one video out of roy thomas uh talking about conan the barbarian right 
and how they got the rights for Conan the Barbarian and with Barry Windsor Smith doing the artwork and stuff like this so I highly recommend if you want to know about Conan the Barbarian take a look at that video because it's got a write-up of uh, I read basically what Roy Thomas has written and we also you know with Savage Sword of Conan because Savage Sword of Conan to me is uh, the greatest the best uh, Conan stories told in comic book format. I love Conan the Barbarian, right? But Savage Sword of Conan, because it was a magazine format, it didn't have to abide by the comic book code, right? So there's a video out there of us flipping through the Savage Sword of Conan collection, the covers that we have, and I read the comic code to you. I believe I put that video together, right? So I highly recommend that as well. But here's Conan the Barbarian issue number 275 the last issue and this thing fetches a premium price because this was the last issue it came out in 1993 and this one is graded at very fine plus okay and the script the writing is by Roy Thomas the pencils is my by Mike Dutri and he's done a lot of work the inks are by Ricardo Val Valagram Al Alfredo Al Alcala and Ernie Chan and Ernie Chan is one of my favorite Conan artists there is he did a lot of work for a savvy sort of Conan okay uh, the letters are by again John Costanza he did a lettering for many many books right for Marvel specifically okay and he's got little notes that I written here uh, continued in Savage Sword of Conan 218 the story here right and this was a giant size and it's the last issue and supposedly this has got a low print run and it fetches a premium price on eBay okay it fetches a premium price everywhere we ended up getting this for five dollars and fifty cents Canadian four dollars and twenty cents US okay and it's a 60 uh, 68 page giant okay it's a 68 page issue right and the cover price was this was 315 Canadian so we paid a little bit more than cover price two dollars and fifty cents US we paid four dollars and twenty cents US great price very happy to have this I don't have the full Conan uh, the Barbarian run uh, I have more Savage sort of Conan the Conan the Barbarian uh, but I have the Conan the Barbarian uh, Savage Conan the Barbarian the early issues and we will be doing a reading of this Conan of not this one specifically but Conan the Barbarian number one with Barry Windsor Smith uh, artwork okay fantastic fantastic this one I'm happy to get and this links up to I'll show you this one and another one right after it okay this is Superman's girlfriend Lois Lane giant size annual number one okay it came out in 1962 it's graded at very good plus right let me show you this the full thing right now the cover is by Kurt Schoffenberger okay and he did a lot of work in the golden age of comics I show you that this guy here golden age of comics and silver age of comics as well right um, he did a lot of work on captain marvel and the marvel family and stuff like this now the script for this there's it's there's a few different people that wrote for this right it's an annual so it's a compilation of different stories here let me show you some of the stuff that you see here so lois lane has all these characters right i haven't read this i haven't flipped through it yet awesome right. oh, fantastic fantastic super cool okay now the writers for this Robert Bernstein he did some work on EC comics and he's done a lot of work on Superman and action comics and stuff like this Jerry Coleman he did a lot of work on Superman Bill Finger the co-creator of Batman right has pieces in this 
written at least, I think, one of the stories, right? And the one I want to really mention is Otto Binder, right? Now, Otto Binder, that name might be familiar to you if you've been following our comic book readings, right? Because we did a reading of Weird Science Fantasy number 28 from EC Comics from 1955, okay? And Joe, I I believe Joe Orlando had written a piece, but also we read a piece that was written by Al Fel, um, Al Felstein, Fel, Felstein. Oh, I can't pronounce the name. Should we find it? Let me find it. Let me make sure I uh, pronounce these names correctly. Well, Al Felstein. Science number 28. Let me see if I can find it in one go. <clears throat> there it is. Oh, no, that's not it. It's the other one. So we did. Okay. We did a reading by, it was... A script from EC Comics number 28 published in 1955 Joe Orlando okay and we did a reading of Lost in Space by Otto Binder and we did a reading of a story called The Trial of Adam Link okay and that was written by Albert Feldstein right and there's a little bit of story connecting Otto Binder and that did has written some pieces, has written one story in this, right? Now Otto Binder, him and his brother did a lot of writing. Otto Binder huge. He, he's written tremendous number of stories, right? Um, during the golden age of comics. And uh, he did short stories, and I believe he wrote all the way up to uh, the Silver Age, obviously, because this goes up to 1962, right? So he's written works in the Silver Age of comics as well. Now, the reading that we did with EC Comics number 28, okay? The first story being Lost in Space, the script was Otto Binder. The second story was The Trial of Adam Link, and that story is adapted from the sequel of i robot written and it's a short story and that's the book i was looking for before we uh like the day before yesterday before we're shooting this video yesterday i was looking in my collection trying to find the the story i have short story i have in sort of a thick book format of um amazing where is it amazing stories it's sort of a magazine format sort of a thick anthology really of a whole bunch of different writers it's the january 1939 printing issue of amazing stories which contains the story of i robot right and that story was written by let me see if i can pronounce this correctly Ian, Ian O. Binder, E and O. Binder. And Ian o, Ian o Binder is a pseudo name that Otto Binder and Earl Andrew Binder used, the brothers, when writing stories, some of the books, comic books, as well as short stories, because it was sort of taking the first letter, Earl, E, and the word and, O, Iando, okay, putting their both their names together the first letters sort of mixed together and printing stories under their name right so i robot iando binder uh, in weird science fantasy 28 that we read with the trial out of link was a sequel to i robot that auto binder had written uh in sort of a short story anthology of books 
Okay. Um, I just found out, uh, found out, found found out to be pretty fascinating, and the number of stories that he had written is uh, amazing. Of how prolific Otto Binder was in putting out books. Okay, putting out stories. So very happy to have this in my collection. Now this thing was graded at very good plus, and it ended up costing us. And we got this at a great deal. And he had, I mean, he had an eighty dollar price tag on this, right? I guess he was selling in the back bins. He put it up to see how much it would go for. We got this thing for eleven dollars and fifty cents Canadian, which is eight dollars and seventy eight cents U.S. Fantastic, fantastic, awesome, awesome, awesome. Okay. Now, let me show you this one. This one I've been chasing. I've been trying to get my hands on them at a good price. We paid fair value for this. It didn't go at a good price. It went at a okay price, right? If I waited a little bit, might have been able to get it at a better price, but maybe not, saving a couple of dollars here and there, right? Here's Action Comics 484, okay? From 1978, this is graded very fine plus, so it's high grade. That's the reason I went for this, right? And this is an Earth 2 wedding of Superman and Lois Lane, okay? And it's the 40th anniversary issue. The, the, the pencils for this, okay, the cover pencils for this are done by Jose Luis Garcia Lopez, okay? And the inks are Dick Gerardo, Gerardano, okay? And we've seen books by Dick Gerardano before, okay? The script for this is by Carrie Bates. The pencils, the story inside, is done by Kurt Swan, and the inks are by Joe Galia, okay? Superman takes a wife, right? Fantastic. I really wanted this issue i've been tracking this issue like joe uh, judo joe i've been tracking this one as well same with conan the barbarian 275 i'm trying to get good deals on both of them on all three of them right happy to have this and can you see what they both have in common <laughs> right. let me show you this in this one the annual lois lane is dreaming which came out the annual came out when did the annual come out? I forget, 1962, right? Lois Lane is dreaming about marrying Superman. And in 1978, Lois Lane does marry Superman, but it's in the Earth 2 uh, universe where she marries Superman, right? Fantastic. And Earth 2, um, I had to look this up. I forget when Earth 2 was introduced. It's sort of part of a multiverse where there's different Earths and all the heroes interact differently and they behave differently. Some have died, some have, you know, some of the villains are not the villains or the heroes or whatever it might be. The first appearance of Earth 2 is Flash number 123, which came out in 1961. Okay. The last two comics that we have are they're action comics. Action Comics number 368. Okay. And this thing came out in 1968. It's graded a fine, very fine. Okay. Ended up paying four. Oh yeah, the other one. Did I mention how much we paid for this one? How much did we pay for this one? We paid eight dollars and six cents Canadian, which came out to six dollars and fifteen cents US. And it's graded very fine plus. That's not a bad deal. That's not a bad deal okay this one action comics 368 uh, fine very fine we ended up paying four dollars and 25 cents canadian three dollars and 24 cents us okay the script ready for this the script auto binder right more auto binder okay the pencils is ross Andrew Rowe, okay, and the inks is Mike es Esposito, okay. That's for the first story. The first story is called The Unemployed Superman, and the story with, I read up on it, it was like Unemployed Superman. It's basically 
alien beings have come to earth and there's no more violence no more uh, no more villains so superheroes aren't needed so superman's out of a job right i got a feeling the aliens are going to be evil <laughs> i haven't read it yet <laughs> right. the second story is called uh superman stand to save uh stan hope okay and the script is carl bates and the pencils is kurt schoffenberger which is uh, one of the people that the that did the well he did the cover for this one right lois lane annual number one and there was a fair bit of artists involved in this one uh should i read you some of the artists for this one some of the artists for this one uh, george papp kurt uh, schoffenberger john ford al uh, plastino worked on this one as well we should give credit to the artist as well right but this one happy to have right happy to have and it's graded uh, fine, very fine, sort of mid-grade, higher mid-grade. Okay, I don't have this one in my collection. Action comics. There's a lot of action comics out there, right? We're up to a thousand plus issues of action comics. If you don't include, well, no, I guess they included. They did the added up the numbering for the previous titles as well, right? The last book that we got was Action Comics number three fifty one. And this one was graded fine, very fine again. And we ended up getting this one for $4 Canadian, $3.05 US. And one of the stories, Auto Binder, right? Awesome. Really, I became a, a fan of Auto Binder um, when we read uh, Weird Science Fantasy number 28, right? Especially Al. Um, well, Feinstein is uh, amazing, right? So the, the, the people that worked on EC Comics are absolutely amazing and glad to see some of them have worked on Action Comics as well, which a lot of them did, right? They worked on a lot of different, uh, at a lot of different publishers. So the story by, one of the stories by Otto Binder, the pencils, uh, the artwork by Wayne Boring, okay? Another story in this, ready? Ready for this? Jerry Siegel, the co-creator for Superman, right? And the story that's by Jerry Siegel in this issue is a reprint of uh, uh, Superman's pal, Jimmy Olsen, that came out in 1954. And this guy came out in 1967. So 13 years later, they reprinted part of the story by Jerry Siegel in this one. And the art by was by Kurt Swan and the inks by Stan K fantastic fantastic very happy to have this haul now i don't have any more bids up on anything else i'm tracking some stuff i'm always tracking stuff on online uh, trying to see if i can get any amazing deals or whatnot but if you're not buying in my part of the world in canada shipping costs a lot right so if i'm not buying a lot from a lot of issues from someone else that's not local to me then i try to get uh, my hands on try to do a major buy that way the shipping cost is distributed across all the issues right so it doesn't come out it doesn't kick up the price too high right so aside from just tracking some stuff this is most likely going to be one of the uh, we probably won't do another comic book haul for a while until I build up my budget because I am trying to build up my budget there's some stuff I'm trying to track uh, from the golden age of comics specifically trying to get my hands on and i do have to have a sort of a buffer sort of a budget to be able to get my hands on those but we'll see where that goes maybe we can get our hands on judo joe number two and number three right complete that series okay uh thank you for watching i hope you enjoyed this haul sorry if i went up on certain rants i got pretty excited about uh getting this haul and once i go once i start doing research for comic books and uh, once I start doing research for almost anything, if I find it interesting and it's 
uh, it's sort of part of my life a love that I have I sort of go down a rabbit hole and sometimes I find myself spending a day or two days just reading up on history and where things have come from and what they are right comic books is one thing I do this with so I ended up finding some information I left some on the board on the table right <laughs> we didn't I didn't take the notes for stuff it's in my short-term memory and you know maybe we'll talk about some of the stuff in the future right but um, I wanted to share as much as I could with you guys because I know there's some uh, comic book collectors that uh, really appreciate uh, what we cover here and some historians that like to put things into context as do I I love to put to put uh, the history of comic books into our history because it is our history how things came to be in the stories being told right like for example the story that we did the reading that we did for weird science fantasy number 28 with the trial of adam link that came out in 1955 right now that story really if you don't want to watch it in video format you i'm pretty sure you will be able to find it on uh, on comic book plus to read it but that story i'm going to give a little bit of spoiler here so if you if you want to watch that video please don't listen to the last minute on this video right but that story is about artificial intelligence is about an android right having to deal with mob mentality in our society and it incorporates sort of a lynching mentality in our society as well as questioning what life is as well as huge science fictions and the implications of artificial intelligence right taking an android and putting him on trial when I was reading that book really that story while we were reading it and afterwards right I've, I've gone back to this this story that we did afterwards the story reminds me of a movie i haven't read the book but the movie i've watched with gregory peck which is to kill a mockingbird right and it's an amazing movie to kill a mockingbird the black and white movie that came out the original movie and it really gave me that feel of to kill a mockingbird amazing stories right amazing stories being told in the golden age of comics in the 1930s 40s well 1940s and 50s through some of the publishers that basically went bankrupt when censorship hit the industry right fantastic human history okay i hope you enjoyed and i'll see you guys in the next video bye for now